Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Disturbing video of an attack on an elderly man inside a local nursing home. Tonight, Detroit police have someone in custody. A strange sight in the flood ravaged village of Sanford, where one specific model of car is scattered all over town. And Governor Whitmer dialing down some of the restrictions on businesses and gatherings as the state's COVID-19 numbers remain flat. And that's where we will start here at 6 with the big headlines in the coronavirus pandemic. A claims court uh, judge has decided to side with Governor Whitmer in the legal challenge to her emergency powers filed by Republican leaders in the legislature. A judge ruling the challenges to her authority are meritless. The governor today said a short-term extension of her stay-home order beyond May 28th will likely be necessary in the coming days. But here's what's reopening and what's okay to do in public again. First, effective immediately, gatherings of 10 or fewer people permitted, provided everyone is practicing social distancing. Next Tuesday, auto showrooms and non-essential retail stores can reopen by appointment only and with no more than 10 customers at a time inside. And finally, next Friday, non-essential medical and veterinary procedures get the green light. We know that's one a lot of pet owners have been anxiously waiting for, Devin. Yeah, the uh, governor says despite these changes, everyone needs to stay vigilant. What we don't want to do is simply drop all of our guard. What we don't want to do is to just simply re-engage as though nothing's changed. Life has changed, and it's important that we change along with it so we can safely get back to some normalcy. And speaking of not letting our guard down, the CDC put out some new guidelines that may have people worrying less about the virus spreading via surfaces like the packaging of your groceries. Dr. Frank Me George here to clarify what the experts are really saying. We'll have that in just a couple of minutes, so stick around. But first, disturbing video of an elderly man taking punches inside a local nursing home has led to an arrest just hours after the video went viral. Our Grant Herms has more on this very upsetting story, Grant. It is an upsetting video and it only came to the attention of police after it was shared online. Dozens of people expressing their outrage and asking the question, how could something like this happen in a place where there was supposed to be supervision? The video is upsetting. It was spread all around social media this morning, but by this afternoon, Detroit police had already made an arrest. The video is hard to watch. A 75-year-old man in a nursing home being punched repeatedly by another patient who appeared to be videoing the beating himself. Local 4 has chosen to blur and stop the image, but the disturbing assault continues for almost another minute until the elderly man begins to bleed. Online, there was outrage. Dozens of people saying they were shocked. One woman on Twitter asking, how can you do this? I feel physically sick. It was initially Ann Arbor police who alerted Detroit police to the videos which had already been widely shared. The nursing home, Westwood Nursing Home in northwest Detroit, told police today they had not yet seen the video. What our investigation is, is, is uh, revealed so far that the nursing home was unaware of an assault until they saw the video. Uh, we're still investigating that aspect. Detroit police were able to quickly arrest the 20-year-old man who was being held in complaints of some degree of assault and battery. The 75-year-old man is now being treated at a local hospital. And we should say that man is being treated for non-life-threatening injuries. Police just told us that a few moments ago. Also a few moments ago, the law firm representing the nursing home sent us a statement saying they are cooperating with the police and that attacker was a temporary resident there on rehab and uh, recovery services and that they will continue to work with police during their investigation. In Detroit, Grant Herms, Local 4. It's absolutely sickening. Okay, Grant, thanks. Of course, President Trump in our neck of the woods today. And while he was here, we learned that he's approved Governor Whitmer's request for a federal emergency declaration for those affected by this week's devastating floods in Midland County. And as the floodwaters recede, the extent of the damage becoming clear in places like the village of Sanford. Take a look at live drone pictures here above Sanford Lake, which is now disappearing the way Wixom Lake did. Let's get to Sean Lay, who's live on the ground. It's just uh, amazing to watch, Sean. Devin, the second time in two days we've seen this right at this hour. Another Michigan lake 
disappearing before our very eyes. Take a look behind me. This is what's left of Sanford Lake. There's not going to be much left in the next few hours or days. Look clear across and in the middle of the lake, you see the lake bottom. This is naturally occurring. The pressure on the Sanford Dam was just too great. The levee gave way, so this is a slow drain. Far different than when the Wixom Lake, the dam there, broke free, sending a wall of water right down this way into the village of Sanford. In fact, there tonight, one man is still looking for parts of his car collection. This hoist right here had that white one on it. Tim Evans is finding. And there's four Fieros in the back parking lot. His Fieros. These were all locked down. The they got flood took them all up. Pontiac Fieros. That was uh, about $7,000. A famous Fiero collection. That was $10,000. Now scattered all over the village of Sanford. 13 Fieros were at his shop and museum called Fieros Forever. It's a Fiero fix-up place. We, we love the Fiero. But late Tuesday, the Titabawassee River began to rise. Neighbors jumping in to help Tim move his cars. We had them all up on Main Street out of the water when we left town. And later that night, we saw them floating down the road. That was heartbreaking, too, because the community came together and pulled those Fieros out of the water initially and then they got flooded anyway. While we were still doing that is when the dam broke up there. And uh, we had just a few minutes to get out of here. And yes, Tim was able to flee in a Fiero. I did. I, I, I left and, and I went around the block and we had just put the battery in. There, there's a few, maybe one or two that I don't know where they are. Did you catch that? There's one or two that Tim does not know where those Fiero cars are. So he'll be walking around town again looking for them. He was going to retire, guys, in April and sell his collection. COVID-19 put that on hold. Now his collection is destroyed and this lake, Sanford Lake, is no more. Today we talked late today to state, local, federal officials and local officials here in Sanford. They do not know if they will see a lake here again. They just can't answer that question right now. We're live in Sanford tonight. Sean Lay, Local 4. Just extraordinary. All right, Sean. Meantime, the local four defenders are uncovering new information about what might have led to the failure of the Edenville Dam. Defender Karen Drew hearing from the dam's owner and from the state as the investigation gets underway. Karen. I'm local four defender Karen Drew. It's now turned into a bitterly contested finger pointing match on who's to blame for the Edenville Dam failure. The dam owner blames the state. The state says, wait a minute. Tonight, the defenders with the documents that shed light on this controversy. As residents figure out what's next for them, investigators are trying to figure out how this catastrophic mess happened. We will pursue getting, um, holding people accountable. And, and that's what I know. Boyce Hydro recently issued a statement saying in part, it was under pressure to raise the level of water at Wixom Lake a month before the dam failed. Eagle is denying it ever pressured the owner to raise water levels, but they did approve it. In this document from February of this year, it shows the state agency did authorize the company to raise the Wixom Lake level to normal summer pool elevation during the spring of 2020. Eagle telling the defenders that approval came with several conditions as the state agency was concerned about the company lowering water levels in the winter, damaging natural resources. Alleging that they had uh, damaged uh, wetlands and uh, also some endangered mussels in, in, in other wildlife habitat. Dam failure isn't unheard of in Michigan. According to a recent report card on Michigan's infrastructure of the approximate 2,600 dams in the state, about two thirds are older than their 50 year design. There are other dams and other infrastructure across the state and across our country that have been underinvested for decades also. The report states Michigan has 140 high hazard potential dams, which means it has the potential for loss of life and property damage if the dam were to fail. Recent example, 2003 Silver Lake Dam failure near Marquette, which resulted in $100 million in damages and economic losses. This is pretty devastating. We caught up with Hilton Headley today. He too wants to know who's to blame, the dam owner, the state, maybe both. But right now, he just wants to know what's left of his home. Karen Drew, Local 4 Defenders. 
Well, as you saw live here on Local 4, President Trump did not wear a mask in front of the cameras while touring Ford's Rossonville plant in Ypsilanti today. But tonight, Ford is confirming he did put one on briefly during a private part of the tour. Our Rod Maloney joins us live with more on the president's visit. Rod. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon. You know, the president came to Michigan essentially in full campaign mode. He was touting his manufacturing record, talking a lot about that inside the plant. But the main thing he wanted to do here was to thank the uh, workers who are out here on the front line building stuff that they normally do not. But he's grateful they did. If that's where she wants you to be, is at home. No doubt about Michigan's battleground state status, both sides, pro and anti-Trump, lined up to see the presidential motorcade outside the Rossonville plant this afternoon. I'm just completely disgusted with our president. It's not even a partisan thing. He's just inept. Support my president, support America, support the things I believe in. That's why I came out today. Inside, the president participated in an African-American summit regarding virus response in Metro Detroit. He then took a tour of the Rossonville plant that usually makes auto parts, but is now converted to a ventilator manufacturing facility for General Electric Health. The president praising Ford Motor Company for its part, shutting down auto production and creating a new arsenal of democracy. He was most proud of the employees, the UAW workers, who jumped into action. Every one of the workers in this project volunteered to take part in the greatest industrialization and mobilization project that our society's done, the American people have done in our lifetimes. Now, the president also is talking about some other manufacturing, and one of the things that he said is that it's going to be his goal to take uh, other manufacturing like pharmaceuticals and other medical equipment that is done now manufactured elsewhere and bring that back to the United States. That's how he wrapped up his speech this afternoon. Reporting live in Ypsilanti, Rod Malone, Local 4. You'd get a lot of agreement on that front, Rod. All right. New rules introduced by the TSA will change the way we fly. The measures put in place are not only for your protection, but also for the protection of those working at Metra Airport. Hank Winchester, our consumer investigator, takes us through the changes. Hank. If you take a look behind me, you'll notice a very quiet, empty Detroit Metro Airport. But if you are planning to travel soon, you need to be aware the TSA has some new rules in place. Passengers will keep possession of their boarding passes at all times instead of handing them to a TSA agent. You'll now place the boarding pass on the pass reader yourself. When you're going through security, you're going to be asked to separate any food items out of your carry-on bag. The reason for this, it will lessen the likelihood a TSA officer will need to touch your bag and do an inspection. TSA is now allowing you to carry on one liquid hand sanitizer container up to 12 ounces per passenger. You must remove that from your carry-on bag to get through security. And you'll notice TSA officers at checkpoints and all airline employees are wearing facial protection and face masks. Travelers are being asked to do the same thing. I'll put all the information regarding the new rules and guidelines being rolled out by the TSA on the Help Me Hank page at clickondetroit.com. We're here at Metro. Hank Winchester. Help Me Hank. Okay, Hank. Well, here's hoping everybody had the chance to step outside today if, yeah. just for a little bit. Hi, Ben. Yeah, Kim, uh, some of us got splashed with sunshine, uh, and even though we may see less of it tomorrow, we're going to feel all kinds of summer this weekend. Your Memorial Day forecast is next. You may have heard the CDC change their guidance on how the coronavirus is spread. I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, I'll show you what they're really saying about the risk from touching contaminated surfaces and what it means for you.